Good afternoon, everyone. Today, I'm going to present some preliminary results of my research project on Francis Barrett's The Magus. This study is part of a larger project that invests the impact of Agrippa's lesson on English culture in the modern age. If you have any suggestions, they are welcome. Barrett is the author of the Magus or Celestial Intelligencer, 1801, among the most interesting and most valuable books of English of all law in the opinion of Montague Summers. According to Harrison Butler, it was not until the publication of Francis Barrett's compilation, The Magus or Celestial Intelligencer, in 1801, that the comprehensiveness characteristic of the Renaissance Kabbalists was once again evident in Western magic. By presenting in a single book a large portion of occult literature available in English translation, Barrett's compendium acts as historical evidence for the state of magical knowledge and practice in England at the beginning of the 19th century. The Magus exercised a significant influence on the ideas of the writings of the many magicians who flourished during the occult revival of the later 19th century. Now, Nothing like it was published subsequently until members of the Hermetic Order on the Golden Dome began to produce their own editions and translations of magical and Kabbalistic. The Magus is a particularly useful book for probing the role played by Agrippa, the prince of Renaissance magicians, in the formation of modern English magic. The project has three specific objectives. First, I will reconstruct in detail the itineraries through which the doctrines of Agrippa reached Barrett. The second objective is to understand more specifically the philosophical role that Agrippa's lesson, the obscurous words, had on Barrett, and the reinterpretation that he offers of it. I will clarify the problem of the originality of Barrett's contribution in his iconic representation of the fashions of demons. This research will allow us to understand the complex passage, in many aspects still unknown, from the occult of the Renaissance tradition to the English occultism of the modern age. Regarding the research methodology, I intend to proceed using multiple approaches and this region, the history of literature and the history of art. Francis Barrett, who was he? Little is known of Barrett's life. Barrett, an Englishman by birth and an occultist by profession, was born in London, same time between 1770 and 1780. According to his biographer, Francis King, Barrett studied with the famous physician and astrologer Ethnism Sibley learning the technique of crystal gazing or scrying. In addition to magic, Barrett had another curious passion, that of aeronautics. The young Barrett took up residence at number 99 Norton Street, Malibor, not far from the Vogue Institute. At the time of the publication of the Magus, he was giving instruction in the magical arts at his address between the hours of 11 and 2 o'clock and as he advertises in the book itself. An extremely vexed problem is the attribution to Barrett since 1824 of the anonymous lives of alchemistical philosophers, 1815. The ascription of the lives to Barrett was questioned in 1888 by Arthur Hedward Way in his recension of the book. It says, this anonymous book has been attributed by certain collectors to Francis Barlett, author of the notorious treatise entitled The Magus or Celestial Intelligencer. But it may safely be affirmed that, alike in nature and treatment, it far transcends the extremely meager capacities of, the creed, of that credulous amateur in accordance. According to Timothy Dark Smith, this text was not written by Barlett, but, I quote, it must be admitted that, that, is, is, that it is not Barrett's capacities that are meager, but the order of the lies and worse way himself. Doug Smith writes that the philosophy of the anonymous order of lies, if philosophy such as sketchy and insufficient treatise can be called, differs entirely from Barrett's remarkable 
particularly in the section of the Magus entitled The True Secret of the Philosopher's Stone. I will return to the limits of that Smith's argumentation in the last part of my presentation dedicated to the problem of the relationship between magic and history of magic in Bade. The Magus is a kind of school manual for the students of Bade School of Magic, although it will also attract the attention of readers of early Gothic novels. The book is published by Lackington, the same publisher who will publish Mary Shelley's Frankenstein in 1888. Barrett's students are not easy to identify. Barrett had at least one student, Adotto Parkins. An 1802 manuscript on invoking spirits currently held in the library of the Wellcome Institute ends with the following statement, this most noble science of divine magic, which is the highest branches of learning, is regularly taught in all its parts by Dr. Parkins, pupil to the late Mr. Francis Barrett. There is also a tradition that Barrett's magical system lived on in a small group of students from which arose a Cambridge group of adepts. It has been suggested that the mystic and visionary Fred Hopley was a student of the magical school established by Barrett, and that Hopley was at, at the center of a magical group in the 1815s and 1816s that experimented with the magic prescribed in the Nagus. There is no historical evidence to confirm this. However, Hopley can be identified as following the same magical tradition represented by Barrett. Scholars have also assumed the Magus influenced the occult group led by the Victorian novelist Barwell Lipton, responsible for the English occult revival, as well as the promoter of the occult revival in France, Eliphas Levy. According to C. Nelson Stewart, Levy was inspired by the Magus to visit the London occult group led by Lipton. This would have influenced Levy to produce his own interpretation of Renaissance magic. People generally do want a work on magic, wrote Alistair Crowley in his book Magic in Theory and Practice. According to him, there never has been an attempt at one since the Middle Ages except Levy's. It is quite evident that he was overlooking the Magus by Francis Barrett. The Magus is divided into two books, divided into parts. A third book contains a biographical account of the lives of those great men on whose authority the science of magic is founded. From a comparison between the 1801 edition of the Magus and the manuscript, it is possible to detect some interesting differences. The manuscript contains an unpublished tabulated mention of the moon with the talismans made under the influences of the fixed stars, in the manuscript, the Biography Antiqua, the third final part of the Magus, is absent. In the manuscript, the images that will enrich the printed version are almost completely absent. An exception is the present of the representation of Abracadabra, taken from Agrippa's three books of occult philosophy, present in the manuscript, in the manuscript and absent in the printed edition. In the manuscript, this image is significantly placed in support of the treatment concerning the magical power of words present in the first three days of the work dedicated to natural magic. There are currently no detailed studies on the sources of the Magus, but it worked mainly on texts already translated into English, but claims to have translated those texts not yet available in this language, particularly, I quote, Hermes, Titanius, Paracelsus, Beckham, D, Porta, Agrippa. As regards the La Porta, it should be noted that Magia Naturalis Libri Viginti was available in English translation from 1658. Barrett is also likely to know the first edi Latin edition in four books, Magia Naturalis Libri Quattro, never translated into English. The references to Roger Bacon are free and very vague. It is likely that Bart was familiar with Bacon de Secretis Operibus Artis et Nature, translated for the first time into English in 1659. 
The magus consists for a large part of translated selection taken from Cornelius Agrippa's three books of occult philosophy, translated into English by John French and published in 1651. The Irmis and Pliny sources are literally drawn from Agrippa's three books of occult philosophy. Another very important source is the fourth book of occult philosophy attributed to Agrippa, translated into English in 1655 by Robert Turner, a 17th century astrologer and botanist. Turner translated and annotated the early text for the advancement of learning and for the enlightenment of the general public in England. He is best known today for his translation of important magical and alchemical texts, mostly dating from the 15th and 16th centuries. In addition, in addition to Pseudo Agrippa's four books, these works include the, the Ars Notorium, the Notary Ars Art of Salomon, and two works of Paracelsus, such as of the Chimical Transmutation, Genealogy and Generation of Metals and Minerals, and uh, of the Supreme Mysteries of Nature. This book formed part of the Archidoxes Magice of Paracelsus, which had been published in Latin at Krakow in 1569. Barrett mentions Paracelsus in relation to alchemy, and it is very likely that he has the words translated by Turner at hand. The most impactful text on the problem of ceremonial magic is Turner's translation of the fourth book attributed to Agrippa. The fourth book also incorporates Turner's translation of five additional magical manuscripts, including of Geomancy, which is attributed to Agrippa, Deep Tamero, or Magical Elements, which is ascribed to Peter de Abano and gives specific details on the invocation of, of angels. The Isagoge by Georg Victorius von Bieringen, which was published in Basel in uh, 1563. Astronomical Geomancy, possibly by Gerard of Cremona. And the Arbatel of Magic, an anonymous work published in Basel in 1575. Barrett has modernized the spelling and syntax of this text translated by Turner. The impact of magical works already available in English is certainly important, but not exclusive. For, for example, Barrett translates most of the Tameron conjurations into English from Latin, in which Turner had two feet to let them. In the final part of the second book, Barrett publishes the work, The Magic and Philosophy of Chaitanya's of Spenheim, containing his book of secret theme and doctrines of spirits. This work is actually not by Chaitanya, and the identity of the real author is unknown. Barrett provides its first English translation. Regarding John Dee, Barrett knows the work a true and faithful relation between Dr. John Dee and some spirits edited by Mary Kosovo. A true and faithful relation, as is well known, it takes up where Mysteriorum Libri Quinque left off. Barrett refers to some very curious manuscripts of Dee, a reference to the manuscript of the Mysteriorum Libri Quinque now preserved in the British Library, as well as his magic crystal. In Barrett's time, these manuscripts and his magic crystal were currently made up in the British Museum. The crystal is one of the pieces of equipment he used in his communications with the spirits, and it is still preserved in the British Museum today. Making a book of spirits. In the perfection and key of the Kabbalah or ceremonial magic, Kabbalistic magic is more ambitious in its pursuits than its Renaissance predecessor. But its sources are the four books of occult philosophy and the Eptameron. Almost all of the material contained within the four books of occult philosophy is borrowed directly from the third book of Agrippa as the Occulta Philosophia, which deals primarily with ceremonial magic. The originality of this fourth book is found in descriptions of the spirits of planets and in uh, the instruction for constructing and using a little spiritual or book of spirits, a magical book containing the names of various spirits and demons and an essential tool 
in the invocation of demons. Barnett essentially resumes the procedure of making the book exposed in the fourth book of a cold philosophy. This book, I quote, is therefore to be made of the most pure and keen paper, which is generally called virgin paper. And this book must be inscribed after the manner this, let there be drawn on the left side of the book, the image of the spirit. And on the right side thereof is character with the off above it containing the name of the spirit, its dignity and place with its office and power. Yet many magicians do compose this book otherwise, omitting the characters and images, but I think that it is much more efficacious not to neglect anything above mentioned in the forms. Barrett does not limit himself, however, to checking up the description of the Book of Spirits from the fourth book. He creates an iconic representation of the book, also providing an, an example of a representation of a demon, Cassiel. Cassiel is the Saturday demon. Barrett derives the representation of the demon Cassiel from the fourth book's lesson. The representation offered by Barrett corresponds to the description offered by the Tsuda Grippa for the spirit of Saturn, a king having a bear riding on a dragon. The character above is taken from the list of the characters of evil spirits offered by the fourth book. The Tsuda Grippa calls it penetrate. The bottom character is also drawn from the same text. The Tsuda Grippa calls it broken. Cassiel is the Saturday demon from the, for the pseudo Agrippa and the angel of Saturday for the Heptameron. Without a doubt, according to Barrett, Cassiel he is an evil spirit. From Sunday to Friday, for, for each day of the week, the relative angels and relative heaven are indicated by the Heptameron. The Heptameron also informs us about the seals, the planet, the signs governing the planet of each day of the week. In the Heptameron, these latter elements were represented graphically all together. For educational purposes, Barrett divides them into two distinct sections. In one, the seals of the relative demon, and in the other, is planet and the signs governing the planet. As for Saturday, the name of the angel, Cassiel, is reported, but not that of the relative heaven by the Cameroon, because, I quote, there are no angels ruling the air above the fifth heaven. As for Saturday, Barrett writes, no angel ruling above the fifth heaven. The conjuration reported by Barrett on the right page of the book is the exact transcription of the Latin conjuration of Saturday presented in the Cameroon. We can therefore conclude that the Tamerum is interpreted by Barrett in the light of the key of the fourth book, proving the centrality of this text for the Magus of London. A very original element of Barrett's book is the iconic representation of the passions of demons. The faces of the demons have human features. Where does Barrett draw inspiration from to make them? It is possible to trace in the previous or coeval pictorial production the possible sources of this representation. Mm, there is nothing in Barth's book to say where these grotesque portraits came from, except that he was their designer and everything their engraver. But they do have a kind of artistic, artistic context. On the left, the nightmare. The Nightmare is a 1781 oil painting by Andrew Swiss artist Henry Pusley. It shows a woman in deep sleep pan with a demonic and hack like incubus crouched on her chest. The painting was a huge popular success. This has been an icon of horror ever since it was first exhibited to the public at the annual Royal Academy exhibition in London in 1782. On the right, the first authorized example of Pusley's second version of the nightmare created in 1791 for the Botanical Garden, a poem by Darwin, Erasmus Darwin. In this second version, we can see how the incubus was an evil smile. In the center, a self-portrait as a poem by Pusley. 
On the right, the smiling incubus drawn by Francis Barrett. Barrett may have drawn inspiration from Pugilist's second version of the nightmare created in uh, 1791 for the botanical garden, but he may also have enjoyed portraying uh, the incubus with the expression of his best known portraits. Huxley was also the one who edited the illustrations of the English edition of the Lavater's essay on physiognomy, 1791. The first image is a study of three heads with extreme expressions in a line. We can see in the center an animalistic face in three quarter profile to left with screaming mouth. The second, the second image is Barrett's drawing of the demon as Modeus. Fusely's interest in the fantastic and, and the dreamlike has led him to collaborate with William Blake. On the left, a tornado Zeus battling Typhon from Erasmus Darwin's Botanical Garden, August 1st, 1795, and there William Blake, artist Harry Fusely. On the right, Cassio by Francis Barrett. This is Lucifer and the Pope in Hell, 1794-96 by Blake. Another suggestion, this is Jobs Hebel's Dreams, 1805 by Blake. Perhaps inspired by Barrett, Blake transforms his Zeus into a demon. At the bottom of the painting, we can see some demons' heads. Blake's was the order of a series of visionary heads re reminiscent of Barrett's project of representing the heads of the demons. The visionary head is a series of drawings produced by William Blake after 1818 by request of John Barley, the watercolor artist and astrologer. The subjects of the sketches appear to Blake in visions during late night meetings with Barley has its sitting for portraits. This is certain by Blake. Interestingly, Levy, a talented artist, drew the visionary heads he had conjured up just as Francis Barrett and Blake before him. On the left, Apollonius, as drawn by Francis Barrett. On the right, Baphomet, as drawn by Eliphas Levy, probably one of the most renowned spaces of modern occultism and model for Major Arcana 15 in Waste Tarot. These two drawings by Levy are taken from his History of Magic and Transcendental Magic, respectively. The Magus concludes with a Biographia Antiqua. The Biographia Antiqua contains 18 brief biographical sketches of the most eminent philosophers and magi. Barrett says, in our history of the lives of philosophers, we have omitted nothing that can be called interesting or satisfactory. We have taken our historical characters from those holders most deserving of credit. We have given an outline of the various reports tradition each of them, to which are annexed notes drawn from the most probable appearance of truth, impartially describing their characters and actions, leaning neither to the side of those who doubt everything, nor, nor to them whose credulity takes in every report to be circumstantially true. This is an interesting statement of equilibrium, which is confirmed by the historical treatment actually proposed. In the case of Peter de Abano and Agrippa, for example, Barrett reconstructed the debate concerning the attribution to the two orders of the text considered apocryphal, such as the Epitameron or the Four Book of the Occult Philosophy denying the attribution to Peter de Abano or the first and placing many doubts on the attribution of the second to Agrippa. I have not yet established the full spectrum of Barrett's historical sources, but I can assert with certainty that regarding Agrippa and Peter de Abano, his implicit historical source is the historical and critical dictionary by Pierre Bale, translated into English in two versions in uh, 1709 and 1734 uh, 41. Barrett drones and synthesizes many passages from Bale's dictionary, accepting as Bale 
Now this libertine interpretation of the story of Peter de Abano. Peter was not was condemned, condemned not because he was a necromancer, but because he denied the action of demons in the wonders of nature, thus entering into conflict with the Roman Catholic Church. As already in Bayes' dictionary, a deeper story is also interpreted in the light of, of Nodes lesson. Magic and history of magic follow parallel but not coincidence paths. This is an element that also leads us to reflect on the validity of Doug Smith's arguments regarding the attribution to Barrett of the historical work on alchemist lives of alchemistical philosophers. In light of Barrett's way of proceeding in the matters, the differences between theory and historical reflection are not a good argument on which to base the denial of the attribution to Barrett of this work. The problem, therefore, still remains unsolved. But how to explain Barrett's seemingly contradictory attitude? For Barrett, in my opinion, magic is above all religion. Like any religion, it has a tradition that does not necessarily coincide with historical truth. The two truths can coexist without going into contradiction. The Ptameron and the Ford book are texts that are part of this tradition, although not attributable to Peter de Abano and Agrippa. As for the invitation to historical equilibrium with which Barth declares to approach magic, I think it can be related to what Turner has already argued in his introduction to the English translation of the fourth book. Here, Turner states that readers of magic books are divided into four categories, namely sponges, uh, which attract all without distinguishing, hourglasses, which receive and pour out as fast, bags, which retains only the dregs of spices and let the wine escape, and says, which retains the best, the best only. Barrett seems to perceive himself, rightly or wrongly, as a said, capable of retaining the best wine of magic for his students. Thank you. Thank you, Donato. Thank you.